Tonight together in prayer, let's pray. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would still our hearts. Still our hearts and lift our eyes to heaven. Lift our eyes to heaven so that we may see you exalted among and above all the nations of this world. Lift our eyes to heaven so that we may see you exalted on the earth. And may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Our Heavenly Father, we gather in this morning and we know that it's your kindness and your mercy that calls us to be here. And so we look to you. We look to you for refuge and strength and we look to you to be an ever-present help in trouble. And as we see your strength, as we know that you are strong for us, we put aside every care, every concern, every fear, and we lean into your everlasting arms. We put aside every care, every concern, every fear, because we know that you, the Lord Almighty, are with us. And whatever we face in this world, we seek your help, we seek your guidance, and we seek your strength. Our Heavenly Father, we're glad that you're with us. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit among us to speak to us, speak truth to our hearts, remake us in your image. Our Father, we know that you are perfect and we are not. You are righteous and we are not. You are holy and we are not. And yet through the perfect, holy and righteous life of Jesus, we share in your life. We share in your goodness and we are welcome in your presence. Our Father, we also know that we are sinful. And yet we've been redeemed. We have been lost and yet we have been found by you. We are weak, Father. We fail. We wander away. And yet you keep on seeking us out. You keep on seeking your people. And so we thank you for your great love. For your never giving up for you're always being full of grace and full of truth and full of forgiveness. And so we worship you. We worship you because you are holy, because you are righteous, because you are eternal without beginning and without end. We worship you because you are great and high and lifted up and your glory fills the earth. And Father, if we could catch just a glimpse of this, we would tremble and we would be afraid. And yet here we are with you in your presence. We worship you for your goodness, your forgiveness, your kindness and for your steadfast love. And we worship you because you are exalted far above this earth. Our Heavenly Father, we look around. Nations are in confusion. Kingdoms fall. There are wars and there are rumors of wars. There is fear and there is distress. And yet, as we gather, we can say that we are not alarmed because you are with us. And so we become still in your presence. We seek to know you, to love you, to worship you. And we ask that you would strengthen our hearts to follow you and forgive our sins. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, our Saviour, and our friend. Amen. We began with Psalm 46, and our main thoughts this morning come from Psalm 11. Hopefully, as we read Psalm 11 as well, uh, you will see the connections between them. But we're going to read all seven verses of Psalm 11. And it begins in a very similar way about taking refuge. <clears throat> Psalm 
So Psalm 11, and this is God's word. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. And we end our reading at verse 7. <clears throat> Boys and girls, good morning. Um, I know there are some of you here. I know there are some of you in the church hall. There may well be some of you at home watching online as well. So I'm going to try and speak to you in three places. The good thing is that all I have to do is stand here and hopefully the rest just happens automatically. Just before we think about your story for this morning, I've got bad news for you. The bad news is this, I teach P6, um, but I've got good news for you as well. There's no homework this morning. Um, So you can relax and hopefully just listen to the story and see what we've got. Also, I hope we've got some slides that you can see. We're going to give this a go and see if this works as well. So when we get to that part, there's a few pictures for you to have a look at as well. But let's begin with this. I have a bag with me. Um, I don't know if this is coming up on the screen or not, but this is a bag that I tend to carry with me everywhere I go. Honestly, it's not an advertisement. Um, But it is full of the kind of things you get in a shop like this. So let's have a look at them this morning and see what we've got. The first one is this. I'm tempted to say, good pour it down bread. Um, But the first one is this loaf of bread with me this morning in our grocery bag. Second one is this. Maybe you had some of this this morning for breakfast. I don't know. There's not very many left in this this morning. Second item of groceries. Third one. Not yet opened, but hopefully wherever you are, you can see this one this morning. This is also out of our grocery bag this morning. Orange, if you like orange drinks. Next one. This favourite in our house, not a favourite of mine, but a favourite in our house, tomato ketchup. Maybe you like that with, well, we have somebody at home who likes this with everything, absolutely everything. Another item in our grocery bag this morning. And the last one, now the size of this should tell you how much we like this, um, because we had to go and get this one specially. But if you don't like jam in your bread... You might like this on your bread as well. Um, we're halfway down this or maybe more, and we really haven't had it very long. So maybe you like this, and this is part of our grocery bag as well this morning. So as we tell this story, I would like you to think about the grocery bag as we go along. And our story this morning, well, it's all about Jesus. It's all about how we know we can trust God and how he looks after us. It's called The Singer, and I like to read this as we go along, and we'll see can we get these working. So here's the first one. We'll keep it there just for a moment and see how this goes. Wherever Jesus went, lots of people went to. They loved to be near him. Old people, young people, all kinds of people came to see Jesus. Sick people, well people, Happy people, sad people, and worried people. There were lots of them. Worrying about all sorts of things. What if we don't have enough food or clothes? Or suppose we run out of money. What if there isn't enough? What if everything goes wrong? What if everything won't be all right? What then? What will we do? And Jesus saw all the people, and his heart was filled with love for them. They were like a little flock of sheep that didn't have a shepherd to take care of them. So Jesus sat them all down and he talked to them. And the people sat quietly on the grassy mountainside and listened. And from where they sat, they could see the blue lake 
glistening in the sun and the little fishing boats coming in from the night's catch and the spring air was fresh and clear. Do you see those birds over there? Jesus said, and everybody looked, but like the birds we have on the screen this morning, full of colors. And they looked and they looked again and they kept seeing what Jesus saw. Little sparrows were pecking at seeds along the stony path. And Jesus said, look at the birds. Where do you think they get their food? Do you think they have larders at home all packed up with groceries? Do you think they have kitchens full of food? And everybody laughed because who has ever seen a bird with a bag of groceries? No, Jesus said, they don't do that. They don't need to worry about that because God knows exactly what they need and God feeds them. They don't need to go shopping for groceries. <clears throat> and then Jesus said, look again. Look at all the flowers that you can see. Full of colors, beautiful, bright colors. Where do you think they get their lovely clothes? Do they make them? Do they have to go to work every day so they can buy them? Do they have wardrobes full of clothes at home? And everybody laughed again because who's ever seen a flower putting on a dress? No, Jesus said, the flowers don't have to worry either because God clothes them in royal robes of splendor and not even a king is that well dressed. <clears throat> the people listened. The people knew they'd never met a king, but as they gazed out over the lake, glittering and sparkling below them, the hillsides were dressed in reds and purples and golds, and they felt a great burden lift from their hearts. They couldn't imagine anything more beautiful. Little flock, Jesus said, you're more important than the birds, and you're more important than the flowers, and the birds and the flowers don't worry about the things and God doesn't want you to worry either. God loves to look after the birds and the flowers, and he loves to look after you too. And Jesus came to tell them this good news about how he would always love them and watch over them and watch over the world that he had made. Because the people had forgotten, and the people had wandered far away from God, but Jesus had come to call them back, to forgive them, and to give them everything they needed. This was the song that all of creation was singing at the very beginning, and it was the song that all of our hearts were meant to sing. God loves us. God will forgive us. God looks after us. And that's why Jesus came into the world, to sing the wonderful song, to help them, help them remember who God was, and that no matter what happened, they could always always trust him. So maybe next time you go shopping, you see a bag full of groceries, you'll remember that God always, always cares for his people and that we can always, always trust him. To help us remember all of that, we're going to sing your song now. And the song is, I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. So let's stand again and worship God. <clears throat> This is the 
Let's bow our heads in prayer again. Let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, you are the high king of heaven and of this earth, and we so need you. We need your love. We need your compassion. We need your righteousness. We need your gift of faith. We need your forgiveness, and we need your peace. And we know that your name is above every other name, above every nation, every ruler. And we know that you hold everything in your hand. And so we turn our hearts to you and we seek your help. We seek your guiding hand on our nation. We understand there's great responsibility of those in government. And so we thank you for those who bear this weight. And as they exercise power, we ask that they would do this with justice and with righteousness. Speaking with wisdom, with your wisdom in all that they do, we ask that they would turn again to you for strength and guidance. For ourselves, Father, we ask that we would live godly lives in the world around us. And may our witness of your kingdom affect our world for good and for the honor of your name. Father, we ask that in our churches, the life and the cross of Jesus would take first and most important place. And may the risen, living King Jesus be our vision, be our wisdom, and be the delight of our hearts. And our Father, as we think, as we gather here this morning, we think of the churches across our nation. We remember that throughout the world there are those who are not free. They're not free to gather. They're not free to worship. We think of the many Christians for whom church is illegal. We think of those already suffering death. And we look at them and we remember. And Father, we must say that we are amazed and we are chastened by their faith. A faith that keeps on trusting even in the most difficult of places. And so we ask that you would protect and keep and guard your people. And may we never take what freedom we have for granted. Father, we also think of those ever so close to home, people we know, friends, family, those who are close to us, those we love. For those who need protection, be our shield. For those who need rest, be our shelter. Restore broken hearts. Lift up those who have been hurt by a careless world. Hold on to those who feel lost. For those who are worried, may they see your peace. For those who need a friend, teach us how to be a friend. Teach us how our churches can be families of grace. Our Father, come and draw near to us. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts, answering all of these prayers. We ask that you would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. 
in the sure and certain hope that one day we will stand in his presence and we will see him face to face. And all these things we ask in his name. Amen. Just before we think in a little bit more detail about Psalm 11, we, we turn our hearts to worship again. We're, we're going to sing. Merciful God, O oh, abounding in love, faithful to all who draw near to you. That's the God to whom we turn. Let's worship together. Can we bow in prayer just for a moment before we turn to Psalm 11? Just a few words of prayer. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word, we seek your strength and we seek your guidance. But even more than that, we seek you. Our Heavenly Father, we gather around your word. We ask that you would walk among us. We ask that you would sit with us. And we ask that you would warm our hearts. Amen.
Um, the starting point for Psalm 11 was my classroom about half eight one morning at the, towards the end of last term. I was standing in the classroom before the kids came in and uh, the words in verse three kind of just came into my head. Um, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And our psalm this morning, Psalm 11, asks a really heart-rending question. That question in verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? It's a heart-rending question because it's an honest response to what people have seen around them. Life has a habit of shaking us. And I think it's fair to say that over the last couple of years, there's been this kind of collective shaking, something that we've all known together. But long before a pandemic, we've all known that life can be difficult. We all have our own circumstances, our own experiences of life. Life can shake us in many, many different ways. And that's what's happening in this psalm. And in this psalm, we have a group of people who have looked around. They have seen the circumstances and they they bring their advice to King David. Now, these people may be David's friends, they may be his advisors, we don't really know. But whoever they are, they know that David is under pressure and the situation seems hopeless. And from that hopeless situation, we hear this question, the big question of the psalm, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? But while that might be the main question of the psalm, it's not the answer. And it's certainly not the main idea. The main idea is so much better. And to understand the psalm, we have to see the main idea that lies behind everything else. And the main idea in the psalm is faith. And that's really where we need to begin. And as we work through this psalm today, we are invited to listen into a conversation between David and his friends, his advisors. And we might imagine it this way. David is standing maybe in the palace with his advisors. David's on one side of the argument. His advisors are on the other side of the argument. And David has been listening carefully. And he begins his reply more or less at the beginning of the psalm. And as we hear David speaking, we need to hear a tone of amazement in the king's voice. It's almost as if David is saying, is that your advice? Are you really telling me to run? Are you really telling me, in verse 1, to flee like a bird to your mountain? Surely not. And the main idea, the most important idea in this psalm and behind David's reply is faith. And that's where we need to begin, with David's trust in God, because this is the main point. We see this faith in verse 1 and again in verse 7, the beginning and the end. Let's read the two verses. Verse 1, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? And then again, verse 7, for the Lord is righteous. He loves loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. And as we begin our journey through these verses in Psalm 11, it's really, really important that we see how the psalm begins with God and how the psalm ends with God. David is doing this deliberately as he writes the psalm because he wants our focus the whole way through it to be on the God who can be trusted above everything else. David takes refuge in the Lord, verse 1, because he knows that the Lord is righteous, verse 7. God is the beginning and God is the end. And whatever else happens in between, whatever the advice, whatever the circumstances, whatever the danger, God is with us and God is present. So just before we think about this conversation in a little bit more detail, I'd like to read verse 1 again and what David says. This time I'd like to paraphrase it. David is saying something like this. I have already taken refuge in the Lord. God is already holding me in his arms. Why would you tell me to run? David's trust is in the God who is always, always with his people. And for you and for me, in whatever the circumstances of our life, this is exactly the place where we find our rest as well. God is already 
holding us in his arms. Why would you tell me to run? And so we see the big question in the psalm. We see the main idea in the psalm. And so we can turn to the conversation between these people and David's reply. I'd like to read from the end of verse 1 through verse 3. Flee like a bird to your mountain. For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot at the, in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you have any interest in politics at all, you may be familiar with the phrase, advisors advise, ministers decide. That may or may not be true. But if any of us were ever in need of advice, we would like to think the advice would be based on solid facts and evidence. And that's part of the trouble in this psalm. The advice in this psalm, it absolutely is based on solid facts and evidence. David's friends and advisors are right. The circumstances they're facing are anything but good. Verse 2, behold, the wicked bend the bow. They say to David, see David in Jerusalem. See his, his advisors in Jerusalem. David, they say, would you look out over the palace walls? Would you look through the streets of Jerusalem? The enemy is at the gates. Every position, David, is compromised. Run. The wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string. David, would you look? The guns are loaded and ready to fire. Their powder is dry and they plan to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. David, there's an ambush on every corner. There's a sniper in every shadow. David, we can say only one thing. David, run. This advice is full of solid facts and evidence and the circumstances are anything but good. And then it gets worse. Verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Here's that big question. And it points to the absolute destruction of everything they know, everything we know. Whenever we speak of these foundations being destroyed, it's an all-embracing and total collapse. From a personal point of view, David himself is surrounded by his enemies. He's under attack. But this is more than personal because it can also mean the foundations of David's kingdom. The economy, the social and moral order, politics, security, the established institutions, military power, everything has been compromised. Everything is on the point of destruction. And David's advisors, they look around and they see nothing but trouble. Chaos is knocking on every door. And then we can go even further. Because whenever the Bible speaks about the foundations of society, it's always connected with the order and purpose established by God in creation. And as David's advisors look out over their world, they see a world in which God's justice, God's righteousness, and God's purpose are being attacked, ignored, and replaced. And this is not only an attack on King David, this is an attack on Israel's God. And you really don't need me to make the link between the psalm and the world in which we live. But it brings us to the next phrase. Verse 3 again, what can the righteous do? These are the advisors speaking to David again. What can we do, David? And at the most basic level, it's really just an expression of a lost cause. What else can we do except run, they say? But sometimes fear and frustration can run even more deeply than that. And sometimes despair like this can lead to the question, oh, what's the point? And in the context of this psalm, it can mean this. David, what's the point in being righteous? For you and for me, what's the point of the church? Have we achieved anything? All these years of service, all these years of outreach, all these years of worship, and yet after all of that, we look around and we see that the foundations are being destroyed. And we might ask the question, well, what else can we do? It really is a heart-rending question, but it can be even more potent. Because one possible translation of uh, verse 3 is this, when the foundations are destroyed, what has the righteous one done? Meaning God. And sometimes, and maybe you've been here, 
Sometimes whenever we see the chaos of this world, the difficulty of this world, or our own circumstances, we simply just want to ask, Father, are you there? And David's advisors can see only one thing, trouble. And they can see only one solution, to beat the retreat, to withdraw from society and to run for their lives. And the big question is this, what on earth are we going to do? And that's the advice King David receives. But David has an answer. David has a reply. Advisors advise, but kings decide. Let's read verse 4 to verse 6. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur, and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Run, says David. Why would you tell me to run? I have already taken refuge in the Lord. God is already holding me in his arms. Why would you tell me to run? What can the righteous do? Look up, says David. Look up and tell me what you see. And as we look up, we see the whole life of faith that lies behind David's confidence. The Lord is in his holy temple. Look up, says David, because I know who the Lord is. This is the God who loves me, who holds me in his arms, who puts me right. This is the Lord who will put the whole world right. I have spent a lifetime, says David, walking in his presence and step by step by step, I've learned who he is. And as I look back over the years and the months, I want you to know that I haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten those spears thrown by Saul. I haven't forgotten how God led me to safety in the mountains of Judah. I haven't forgotten how Elimelech gave me food and weapons. I haven't forgotten my friend, Jonathan. I haven't forgotten how Samuel anointed me God's true king. And I haven't forgotten the sheep and the hills and the still waters. And how even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is still there with a kind word with friends, with food, with forgiveness, with glimmers of light in this dark world. Look up, says David, because at the moment, the only thing you're telling me about is the trouble of this world, but I have seen the glory of heaven. And I'm not going anywhere. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. And these words of real weight Because they tell us that the real seat of power does not lie on earth. Real power rests in and extends from the throne of heaven. And David says to his advisors this, Yes, I know that the wicked bend the bow. And I know that chaos is knocking at every door. But I also know who God is. And the Lord who sits on his throne in heaven will put things right and I have absolute confidence in him and from here on in in the rest of his reply David explains to us how God is putting in place a great reversal God is turning things round and things change for God's enemies and things change for God's people look at verse 4 his eyes God's eyes see his eyelids test the children of man or examine the children of man This idea of examining and testing is one of refining gold. It's putting it through the fire to see what's pure. And so as God looks and God begins to examine and test the world, we see how things change in a number of different ways. First of all, David's enemies, God's enemies, the ones at the beginning of the psalm who had their arrows ready, well, now they're under attack themselves. Verse 6, coals and fire and burning sulfur will be the portion of their cup. And the fear and the violence and the chaos of this world will come to an end. And things change for David's enemies. Things also change for God's people. And those who were under attack at the beginning of the psalm are now standing in God's presence. Verse 7. For the Lord is righteous. 
He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Safe now in the presence of God. Safe in the arms of Jesus. And our story ends with good news. Jesus wins. Death dies. And the righteous stand in the presence of God. And for you and for me, in whatever our circumstances, and for the church, in whatever part of the world, in whatever circumstances, here is our great reassurance. But I also think we should pause for a moment. Because sometimes we get there too quickly. Because the reason we feel the circumstances of this world and the shaking of this world is because we're not there yet. You and I are still living here with everything that means. So I think it might also be helpful if we say this. In verses 4 and 5, we realize how God is not only testing and examining the world, God is also testing his people. And he does that here and now in our ordinary everyday lives in this world. And in all of the circumstances of this life, God is at work in our hearts, in the practicalities of our life, to transform us into the image of his son. And God is testing and refining us. The Lord tests the righteous. But this testing, it's not one of eternal judgment. It's a refining. It's a putting us right. Because God is working to make us more like him. Just as the carpenter puts the sander on the wood, just as the mason carves the stone to make it fit, God is at work in your life and my life to make us fit for his presence. And we can see it in the life of King David. David was about 17 whenever he was anointed by Saul, but it was another 13 years before David was on the throne in Israel. 13 years of testing And instead of the palace, David lived in the wilderness. And even then, it wasn't over. It was a life's work for God to change David into the person he needed to be. All these years of learning who God was, who David himself was, and what God wanted him to be. It's how you and I grow in faith. There are times when everything might look bright and full of life. But there are times when it's anything but. And yet... In all of these things, God is working for the good of his people. And one day, you and I will stand in his presence, perfect like his son. So let's bring all these ideas together. Because we need to think about a couple of things just as we end. We need to think about the righteous. We need to think about this portion and the cup in verse 6 and 7. Verse 6, let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. So here's a very important question. Who are the righteous? And what is this cup? Well, let's imagine this. Let's imagine that if on our way into church this morning someone had been handing out pieces of paper or cards and you were given a choice. And let's imagine that on one card it said righteous. And let's imagine that on the other card it said unrighteous. Now which one are we going to choose? It's a real dilemma. But let's do what David said and let's look up again. The Lord is in his holy temple and there we see the righteous beholding his face. And as we see the righteous standing in the presence of God, let's think about how Moses stood in the presence of God in Exodus chapter 33. Moses is with God in Sinai and we read this. Moses said to God, please show me your glory. And God said, he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But God told Moses, you cannot see my face 
for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you will stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And here is where the glory of the Christian faith shines most brightly. Because just as God covered Moses in Sinai, Jesus covers you and me with all of the righteousness of his life so that you and I can stand in the presence of God and live. It's the shelter we call the gospel. And it's why this word portion is really important. The portion refers to a cup and a Jewish meal and how the father offered the family and the guests something to drink. And when it's used that way, the family cup was a symbol of blessing and of peace. But here in this psalm, the portion is used as a symbol of judgment against an evil world. Here it's not blessing, here it's judgment. So take one more step with me as we end. Matthew chapter 26. Jesus is in Gethsemane. And Jesus is praying. Verse 39. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And Jesus left Gethsemane. And all of the coals and the fire and the sulfur and the scorching wind of this psalm, they all fell on Jesus. And as judgment fell on Jesus, his righteousness falls on all of those who take refuge in him, who put their trust in him. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, as we leave here today, we step back into a world that's shaking. God is not calling us to avoid the world or to run from the world. God wants his people in the world, not of it, but in it, living for him and trusting him. Tomorrow morning, I step back into my primary six classroom. You will step back into your place of work and into everything that goes along with your family. And as we go, every step is a step of faith. Every step is a step of refining. And every circumstance is an opportunity to ask God what he's teaching us today. And as we go, our Heavenly Father walks with us. The Holy Spirit fills our hearts. And Jesus will keep us in his righteousness and his love. Let's pray together. O oh, safe and happy shelter. O oh, refuge tried and sweet. O oh, trysting place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. I take, O oh, cross, thy shadow. For my abiding place, I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of our Saviour's face. Our Heavenly Father, we look forward to the day whenever we will see you face to face. But until then, we take refuge in you, and we ask that you would keep us in your care. Forgive our sins, deepen our faith, and lead us in paths of righteousness. And may your goodness and your mercy follow us all the days of our lives. Amen. <clears throat>
Let's stand and worship God together. As we go to the world, God speaks to us and goes with us. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.